Hello, and welcome to this product demonstration webinar featuring HiQA 360 software. I am Lisa Sterling, your host and moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I would like to mention a couple of housekeeping items. We invite you to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing in your Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen as your phone is muted during the session. We will address the questions received at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter, Tim Hogan, Vice President of Business Development for HiQA. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Tim. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining us today. As we get close to the holidays, we understand life gets chaotic and we appreciate you carving out a few minutes uh, of your day to spend it with us. So just to broadly overview a couple of things, here's high QA at a quick glance. So we were founded in 2015 and we have distribution partners across the world and we have direct salespeople right here in the US and Canada. So for all of our company resources, 25% of the employees are dedicated to supporting you after the sale. So implementation is a key component of the HiQA solution. And we have an entire team that's dedicated to your success. We currently have over 900 customers globally from small like, three person job shops to multi-billion dollar OEM corporations. So we're very proud of this list, but we're not trying to brag. Uh, we just wanted to simply show you some of our customers and reassure you, we currently work in many different industries, aerospace, medical, automotive, construction, oil and gas, even defense. Now, you certainly didn't take time out of your day to see a bunch of PowerPoint slides. So we're going to jump right into the software in just a minute. To give you an idea of what we're going to show you in our time together, we're going to take a 2D print we're going to one-click balloon it. We're going to show off some of the uh, neat productivity tools associated with ballooning. We're going to build an inspection plan. We'll show you gauge management functionality, uh, create in-process check sheets, and how we um, can help you acquire that data real time on the shop floor. Then we're going to simulate how we can automatically import data from an automated measurement device like a CMM or a VMM or an ARM or tracker or something like that. And we're gonna tie it all together in a first article. So the last thing to mention before we dig into the software is 360. So HiQA 360 is the platform for quality management. At its core is the key element and that's the database. Because HiQA is a database driven solution. So every print, change, gauge, data entry, part history, run charts, flow charts, workflows, FAIs, it's all stored in the database and, and your secured server, by the way. It's not a cloud-based system and it's available real time. So why are we having a webinar the week before Christmas? Well, because we're in the Christmas spirit and everyone loves a good sale. And right now we're offering all customers a 15 month subscription for the price of a 12 month subscription. So this special is only valid for orders received before the end of the year. So please reach out to your local salesperson or let us know in the chat section and we'll reach out to you right away. So let's jump into the software and show you how, it can, how easy it can be. Okay, so here is um, Inspection Manager software. Um, it's uh, very simple. We're just going to open a new file from right here. And we can do new from drawing. We can do new from CAD file. Um, if you happen to have 3D um, CAD files with MBD. But we're just going to simply select sample two and hit open. Now, this is a generic uh, file we use quite often because it's, it's a great representation of a typical print. Right, you have linear dimensions, there's basic, there's regular, uh, there's uh, GDNT. And we're simply gonna come up here and click on auto balloon. And there's different options here. We can do current page, all pages, if you happen to have a multi-page multi print. 
Um, we can not balloon basics, not balloon reference, what have you. But we're just going to click OK and let it run through its sequence here. Now the OCR is taking over. This is our proprietary OCR that we actually developed um, because we needed it to look specifically for GD&T, for dimensions. Um, and so this isn't purchased and used. This is actually something we developed. Um, so that took about 16 seconds or so. And this print is completely ballooned. And more importantly, all of the data, if we look down here in our bill of characteristics, all of the data has already been extracted and populated in the bill of characteristics. So here are all the requirements, the nominals, tolerances, all of this information has been automatically selected and even the drawing zone it came from. So we can populate that into our report later on. So at this point, I wanna show you a couple of the neat features. Um, oh, I apologize. I just clicked on the wrong button. Um, Let's click on this button right here. <laughs> uh, so we're, being we developed the OCR technology, um, we can extract certain things right, out, uh, right off the print, and right out of the title block. For example, if we just box select this right here, we can say this is the part name. And if we look up over here, we can see the part name has now been updated. Subsequently, we can grab the revision and say part revision. We can watch that change from A to B right over here. Additionally, we can uh, balloon notes. For example, if we uh, select this and say, hey, I want to balloon this note, um, it'll automatically balloon it. Now notes, it treats as a pass fail. So once it goes into the database and is in the bill of characteristics, like you can see right down here, um, it will be looking for that data or that information when we go to um, populate it with you know, final data, if you will. So it will treat it as a pass fail. And you can grab as many as you want and um, it'll just keep ballooning them. And you can grab these, you can move them around, you can resize them, you can recolor them, you can, <laughs> whatever you wanna do, you can pretty much do with it. Um, additionally, we can grab the material. I'll just click on the material button and grab the material note right here. And now with material, let's look over at the right side here for a second. Anytime you see a pencil, you'll see this a couple of times as we go through today. Um, it means you can add information or that there's additional information. So a single click on there, we can add material codes, spec numbers, cert numbers. If it came from a specific supplier, we can say what supplier it came from. What a lot of our customers do is they'll come up here to files and say, hey, I wanna upload my, my um, certification to it. So I can say, here's my material cert. I can click on save and close. And now that um, it's kind of a precursor of what will happen that information and that material cert will automatically be on the FAI when we go to report that later on. And I'll show you that as we go. So a couple of neat creature comforts here, some of the functionality in it. Um, if you ever, if we have customers um, listening here, potential customers that have a need to switch between inch and metric and metric and inch, we have a very simple tool right here, this little button right there. And we just simply click on this and it says show alternate units and it automatically switches over to the alternate unit. And yes, you can change the number of decimal places. For example, if it's a, a two place metric print, you wanna to go to a four place um, uh, inch conversion, you can do that as well. So very simple and easy to do. It beats the, beats the heck out of using your calculator in 25.4 all the time. Um, additionally, we can, uh, one thing to specify is, um, let's call it consistency or uh, completeness. For example, if we, we don't claim to be perfect, we, it's going to miss things, it's not going to capture everything all the time. So if we simply come up here and uh, delete this, for example, let's say hypothetically that it missed that dimension. So we can look back and say, okay, did it miss anything? It's hard to see, um, especially if you have a print with an extraordinary amount of dimensions on it. It can be very, very cumbersome to see what it did, um, what it actually got. So we can come over here. We have a whiteout function that we click this and now it whites out everything that it did get. So now we can easily see what it didn't get. And what I'm about to do next 
would be what I'm simulating is if you had to do it manually on your print. So like, oh, it didn't get that. How do I um, capture that information? Simply come up here to this button here and it's a toggle, so it'll stay on. And then just box select right, like, right here. Once I let go, it automatically parses that information over here in the right. And it automatically puts it in the bill of characteristics right down here is dimension number 27. Now added it as 27 because it's always going to add to the end because it doesn't know if it's if it missed it or potentially if it's a revision and it's a new dimension that was added. So we do have full revision control as well. But when I selected that, you can easily see right here, it looked for several things. What do I mean by that? Well, it looked for a linear dimension. It knows it's a basic dimension. It knows the nominal and knows the number of decimal places. It knows all of this information. This is a generic tolerance that um, is defaulted to the system. You can have it be anything you want, but being it's a basic dimension, we just have it um, set as that. Now that we have this information, we can click off of it and then it goes away because now it is um, under the whiteout feature as something that's been um, selected. So if we click on the whiteout again, now we're back to all of the dimensions being here. But we have a problem, right? Now it's completely out of sequence. Well, we can simply come up here to our renumbering button and hit renumber, puts everything back in line. So everything's exactly how we want it. Um, not a problem. Also, just for those people, um, I, I uh, started in the automotive industry. And when I did, they said, hey, you, you balloon this view by view and you go clockwise through view. So we can separate these out into views. And then when we hit renumbering, we say renumber by views. And then that brings additional options as to how you want them, you know, spiral, uh, pie chart. We can do, um, we can renumber them in many different ways. So if you do have those requir requirements, we can do that as well. Otherwise, it just does it left, left to right, top to bottom. Um, if you happen to have requirements for like a four place or a multi place dimension like this, there's a couple different things I'd like to point out about that. So I'm just going to click on it and select it. So one thing to note is that this is three different callouts, right? So we have a diameter, we have a thread, and we have a positional callout. And if we look down here in our bill of characteristics, we can see that there's 17.1.2 and 0.3, and that they're individually called out. It recognized that, again, this was all in the first 16 seconds. It recognized all this, and it also recognized that it's a four-place um, dimension. So when we go later on to create that inspection report, it's going to be looking for 12 different inputs, right? Four for this, four for this, four for this. Um, it's going to be looking for those 12 different inputs. Now, if you want to separate them out, um, for example, I used to, uh, we used to make oil pans in one of the places I worked and uh, <laughs> I swear that to the uh, setup guys would always come on and go, you know, I have one or two holes out, which ones? And then you'd have to figure it out which, which holes are out by the nominals. Well, an easy way to be able to identify those is we can uh, click on this one button right here called multiply dimensions. Once we click on that, it multiplies them out individually and we can click and drag so we can uniquely identify each hole. And also down here in our bill of characteristics, you notice that we don't have the multiplier anymore. It's all under dash one and then dash two and then dash three as we go down and dash four. So we can uniquely identify them or you can keep them all together. In this case, uh, we're just gonna reset this for a little more simplistic of a look. So we have that functionality as well. Now let's get into uh, what we call gauge categories and characteristic designators. So I'm just going to select this dimension here. And if I come over um, to the right side here and under, under our dimension editor, I could come down to gauge category. Now keep in mind, we are still in the planning, what we call the planning phase. So there's planning phase, production phase, and reporting phase. So in the planning phase, what we're trying to do is streamline um, the downstream effects of what we're doing, right? So if we can say, hey, for this dimension, uh, we want to make sure we measure that with, well, I don't know, whatever, blade micrometer, I know it's not right, the blade micrometer. 
So when they go to measure this, they're like, oh, okay, I, I want to measure this with a blade micrometer because this is how it was set up in the category. Additionally, we can also identify uh, designators, a uh, key characteristic, KPC, CTQ, whatever the nomenclature is that you're using. If I just say key characteristic, now I can hit save and those uh, that um, identifiers are linked to this dimension. Now I would like to point out a couple other things. Uh, one, now our designator column shows key characteristic. So we can sort this uh, bill of characteristics by designator if we so choose to. But also we have a rule set up to where if it's a key characteristic, automatically change the sampling plan to be based on an AQL table as opposed to the, to the default. And in this case, the default was set up for one per lot. So we can assign rules easily just based on what we um, call it as a designator. Now, additionally, additionally to that even, we can have um, designators per feature type. Um, let's say, you know, let's get simple and say, hey, every everything that's a diameter, everything that's a hole, we want uh, measured with a pin gauge uh, for a category, and that's a 100% check. We can set up defaults to where whenever you, um, balloon this. So in that first 16 seconds, it would have identified all of the diameters, assigned a pin gauge category, and put it as a 100% check uh, for a characteristic. So we can set those defaults up as well. We also have it set up, just so you're aware, to um, if it's a key characteristic, automatically change the symbol here. So it's more easily identifiable right on the print. So we can do that as well. And again, those are all defaults that are set up completely customizable to whatever you'd like. But speaking of gauge categories, let's go up over here to our measurement gauges. We have a full gauge library in here and a gauge management system available to you. And um, it does all the main things that you'd expect it to, like here's the gauges down here, um, here's the uh, the vendor that we use for calibration, the calibration date, the frequency, the certificate numbers, all of that um, basic information, gauge maintenance, who takes care of it, where the storage place is. This will come into play a little bit more um, later on when we look at the shop floor data collection as well. We can also, um, there are different, uh, a lot of people put attachments in here, like, hey, I get a cert from my third party, where do I put that? there's a place to put it right here, not a problem at all. We can also set up notification settings to where, oh, I get that one here. Um, is that say, for example, if something's expiring in the next, oh, I don't know, 30 days or something like that, um, email this person. And this can be internal or external. Let's say you have a, a company you use for um, calibration. You can email them to say, hey, this is expiring soon. Make sure you get it calibrated in time. And we have schedulers as well. So you can, oops, I clicked on the button. So it's it noted the change. Um, you can schedule things to be um, calibrated as well. Also, the last thing you wanna do is have to re-input all this data, right? So whatever you're using currently, if you happen to be using um, a different software to track your gauges, or if you're just using Excel or something like that, we can import all that information right here, even in undefined format where we just map what, um, map what it is, and then we can identify it that way. I'm gonna get rid of this. So I don't know if you guys can see this, my, the Zoom thing is blocking. But um, so one of the main things and one of the reasons we always bring this up is because we do something that to our knowledge, no one else does. And if I select a gauge right here, I can come down here and I have usage history. I know every dimension that that gauge ever checked. How do I know that? Because I have the engineering requirements and they're in the database. Now I have the gauges and they're in the database. And now I, when I have the finished, um, dimensions that are being measured either on the shop floor or by the CMM or what have you, I have that information as well. And now I can start to correlate that information together because it's all in a centralized location. I don't have a 
uh, disjointed system to where they don't talk to each other. Everything's in the database and talks to each other. So I know right down to the job number, lot number, serial number, what the requirement is, what the dimension number is, what the result is right here, whether it was good or bad uh, or missing. Um, I know who measured it by who logged in, inspected date, time. We can even identify what machine it came from and if it was tied to an NCR. And we'll get into NCRs in a couple of minutes. Um, so I have all of that information right at your fingertips. This is great for if you have a, like a drop gauge, for example, and you're not sure when it went bad and it, let's say it started to check parts incorrectly, you can easily come in here and identify where it started to check parts incorrectly. And now you, from a containment standpoint, you know where to go start checking parts. So that's an excellent way to do it. Um, so let's get back to the part itself. And we're just going to go back to exactly where we were before. And now we're going to start talking about manufacturing operations. And the reason we're going to talk about manufacturing operations is to create our in-process check sheets and look to how we're going to acquire this data right on the shop floor. So first, before we can uh, create the in-process check sheet, we need to identify um, those dimensions that are being uh, made or created or measured or what have you in that operation. So please keep in mind as you see this, this is one of the first steps in bringing manufacturing and quality together. Because historically, they always come together at the end of the process, right? Manufacturing uh, creates their own in-process, creates their own measurements potentially in-process, and then they submit the part to quality and then quality takes it, blooms the print, creates the maybe CMM program or whatever, and then has dimensions at the end. And then at the very end, they come together and say, wait a minute, this doesn't match this, this doesn't match this. So this is a way to start that process beforehand, before they start um, manufacturing the part. So that way, all of the data makes sense and everyone's talking the same language. Uh, for example, let's say we're going to make a roughing operation out of this. Let's select the overall here. There's a little step right here. And we're gonna cut that in, um, maybe overall length. Now we have a little overall um, step right there and we have this step height right here. So let's say we're just gonna rough that in. We can come over here and click on add operation. And now we have an op 10 that's identified. And we can easily see here that there's mul excuse me, multiple operations um, assigned to certain dimensions. And we can easily identify that by the color um, on the print. Also, here's our little pencil again. We can click on this and we can you know, name it something if we wanted to name it, like we'll name this roughing, for example. Click on OK. And now if we look, we have a roughing op and then you always have the finished part operation, right? And that's locked. Anytime you see a padlock, you can't do anything with it um, because we need to measure everything for the finish because that's what goes on the FAI. Um, but down here in our bill of characteristics, we also have manufacturing operation. Well, I can select this and say, oh, I just wanna look at my roughing. Well, now I have a print that only has the roughing operations identified. So you can print this out and hand it to your shop floor people, personnel or in shop floor inspector, whomever that's going to be measuring these just to help easily identify it. Um, but we have, um, we have a problem because we're going to uh, rough this part, right? It's not the finished dimension. So we have to adjust things uh, accordingly. And when we ask our customers, well, how do you do that? And they're like, well, we rely on the people out on the floor to you know, know that they're leaving the material that they need to. So a way we can um, discuss this is we can select all of these and we're gonna do a bulk update. Bulk update just means do the same thing to all of them. And now we can come over here on the right side of our bulk update and say, okay, let's change the nominal value um, of this. And let's say we want to add 10 thousandths of um, stock to that uh, dimension. And we can add it, subtract it. We can go by percentage, multiply, however you want to do it. There's a lot of different flexibility here. We can also change the tolerances. We can change the number of decimals. We can uh, assign gauge categories right here. We can change what the balloon looks like. You want them as triangles or rectangles, whatever you want. But we'll just hit apply and close. 
And now all of our nominals have been adjusted by 10,000 for this specific operation. And it's right in the bill of characteristics. So now if I go up and say, I want to create an inspection plan or what we call uh, in-process check sheet, um, and you can have any report template you want. And I say, create a report. It's going to generate a report in Microsoft Excel that can be used anywhere out on the shop floor. And you can see right here, here's our information that we captured using the OCR when we were ballooning it originally. So it has all that information. Um, here's our operation 10 that we created. And all of our nominals have been adjusted by that 10 thousandths of an inch uh, to be able to um, properly identify that during the in-process check, right? So nobody has to and do math in their head to figure out what they need. So that's all capable. But let's talk about getting data back into Inspection Manager. So once we start talking about that, one way, and I'll be the probably the hardest way, would be to populate this. Let's say, example, you had uh, information in here. We can take this information, um, bring it right back into Inspection Manager, and have it populated that way. Maybe it's a good first step for, for, uh, for people. Additionally, Hit don't save. Additionally, we have a shop floor interface we call IME IMX. IME stands for IM Explorer, IMX stands for uh, IM Express. So I'm going to log in here. Oh, I'm, oh, I missed it. There's a, you can also scan badge to log in. So everyone on the floor, anyone using this would have their own unique login. Um, now, here's a good example of how things are tied together, because we have a gauge button right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, explain something right before I hit that. Um, so this is a um, so this is a browser-based application. Okay, this is simply going to an IP address. But again, this IP address isn't um, you know, remote. It isn't outside your system. It isn't out on the web. It's just pointing to an IP address within your intranet. Um, so it's all secured and locked down. Um, but when they log in, um, they can come in here and even select gauges, for example. And being it's pointed to the same database, uh, they can assign and check out gauges right here. For example, if I wanted to um, check out a micrometer, I can say, okay, here's my micrometers. Um, here's the one I want. And this is just uh, selects the micrometers, the different micrometers that are in, again, in the database and in the gauge management, um, that are entered into the gauge section, the gauge management section. So I can simply come in here out on the floor and say, oh, I need to check this out. And now that I'm, I'm logged in, I have more information here, right? I'm checked, it's currently tracking status is checked in, name is here uh, with the current location, what the brand is, if it's active, if it's within um, calibration. And I can just select right here where I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it to the new plant. And I'm gonna check out this gauge. So now the current place has been updated to main plant and the current user has been um, updated as well. And then when, when it is returned, they can simply say return it and it's right back to where it was before. So it can all be tracked right inside here. And this can be on a, uh, like on a tablet or any type of computer system out on your floor. Um, it's, again, it's very lightweight, it's just an app. So typically when we want to bring data back into Inspection Manager, we're going to use one of these two features right here. Um, this has this as well. This is just by part number and job. But if we're going to gallery search, if you're used to like Apple products, this is a good way that they um, identify their um, pictures, how they can kind of scroll through your pictures by a little gallery. And you could do the same thing here. So if you can imagine all of your parts would be listed here and they can just scroll through and say, okay, which part am I working on? You can go by customer name, project name, part name, whatever you'd like. Um, you go by job number, say, oh, I'm doing job PR9. I can select PR9. Then it says, oh, here's your print for PR9. I say, okay, I'm going to go into that job. Now there's jobs, lots, and samples. Okay, so you have a job of like 100 parts, let's say, and then that's going to be broken into two lots of 50 parts. 
And then you're gonna have samples within those 50 parts that you need to measure. So that's why there's three tiers. So we're in job nine and we have a nice little dashboard here that shows you, okay, how close is it to being done? Um, how many dimensions have been checked down here? How many have passed? How many have started inspection? We can see that we started all of them, um, but haven't finished them all. Um, if any are failed. So we have all that information right there. And now that we're into the lot, now I know inside this lot, what the um, dashboard is like as well to identify the, um, the features and characteristics that are done inside that lot. But if we just go into the part itself, now I'm into the sample, right? And if we click up here, we can see that finished part and I have my roughing op right here. I can select my roughing op. And now I have the information. I delete that information out of there really, really quickly. Um, and by the way, I just deleted information out of here. You normally can't delete information out of here, okay? Um, you set up permissions and permission levels based on user login. So maybe you want to have some people that have that permission, other people you don't. So that's all permission-based, okay? So that was a good segue into that. But now that I click on this, I can um, input the data right into Inspection Manager. Okay, right into the database. And how is everything tied together? So when I measure this, I'll have to select on the exact gauge that I'm using. And if I say, hey, this was my blade micrometer. Oh, here's my blade micrometer. I'm going to select this. And now my blade micrometer is selected right here. Oops, I, the, the circle is when I hit control on my keyboard. So you can see, I don't know if you can see or not, this is blinking. This box here is blinking. It's actually listening. So if you happen to have like an RS-232 out, a uh, Bluetooth gauge, a wireless gauge, something like that, this is listening for that input data. So you can easily just um, you know, click the button and have it populate there. But let's enter this information here. We can click accept. Oh, by the way, before I do that, um, a lot of our, I point this out, a lot of our customers find this a, a very nice tool down, if I can uh, focus your attention down here. Um, this is simply a nominal, and you can tell it's been adjusted, right, by that 10 thou, because we're in our process, our roughing operation. So this is the nominal, and then here's the spec um, zone. This isn't meant to, you know, have them control the numbers by all, by any means. But it's just a nice visual representation of okay, where should it be within here? And if I get a if I get a, do get a measurement, where does it fall before I even enter the data? Okay, so just a, our customers find that to be very helpful. So if I just click accept here, it turns green and then automatically moves on to the next one. It retains the tool that I was using already. Oh, Got to stop doing that. And now if I um, enter in a bad uh, reading and hit accept says, oops, wait a minute, this measurement is out of tolerance. Would you like to measure it again? We can say, oh, I must have mismeasured it. I can measure it again. And if I get the same measurement or a measurement out of spec again, it's like, oh, no, it's really bad. Let's say keep failed. So once we hit keep failed, it'll automatically pop up with an NCR record that they can start, okay? So we just simply click on add new, say, okay, do we want to add one? And now it, this is another neat thing about the database, right? It has all this information already. It has the job number. It has, I'm logged in, so it has me as logged in. It knows the date, the time, it knows the lot. It, there's the unique um, code for it. If you happen to be like, oh, I'm in a specific work cell. Um, and then what's the disposition? Oh, I you know, scrapped this part out. I'm gonna say, okay. And now we have defect codes where you can say, okay, where was the defect type? Was it porosity in the casting? Was it, you know, what was it? Um, oh, this was in the machining. I say, okay, and now it's saved and right in there. So you can track NCRs as well. Um, want to show you uh, the difference between um, IAM Explorer and IAM Express really quickly. Explorer kind of shows everything, if you will, out on the shop floor, it gives a lot more flexibility. Express is a more limited uh, view. Um, it only shows specific things that are assigned to people. Okay, so if, as you can tell, you're coming into the um, into Express, and there's it's simplified, right? There's only certain things you can see. 
because I'm logged in. So I'm only gonna see things that are assigned to me. So I'm gonna select this. And I know this is assigned to me and I'm going to, this is the job inside of here and here's the samples that are assigned to me. And if I select that one, now it comes right into the same type of view, but you can also see that this is a little different modified in, in simple as well, right? We don't have the, the characteristics identified on the left. Um, we just have the print and then what the dimensional requirements are across the top here. And I can enter this information in here. And again, this is the same idea. If I enter in the wrong inform or the, a bad result, same pop-up comes up, same ability to add an NCR. So you still have all of that functionality in Express. It's just a simplified way to view it. So let's get back into Inspection Manager. And by the way, I know we're covering a lot and we're going pretty quickly through it. Um, please keep in mind this is recorded and will be sent out. So you feel free to review it, stop, start, whatever you need to do. Um, let's go into the finished part. I'm going to go back to the dimension editor. So this is where we were before. Now we're going to simulate bringing in data from, um, uh, from like a CMM or a VMM or what have you. So what I'm about to do next, you actually wouldn't have to do um, because we have uh, a way to bring this data in automatically so you don't even have to touch it. As soon as it comes out of your um, automated measurement device, it would populate into a folder and we would just be listening for anything to hit that folder and then we would automatically bring it in. For example, this is the like raw data that would come from your CMM or other automated measurement system. So we just hit import. And once this data is imported, now we have a nice visual to see, all right, what's good, what's bad. And we can see right in our bill of characteristics down here that we're looking at sample one and lot one. So let's look a little closer um, at these dimensions here. So this came in from our, um, let's call it CMM, and this dimension was bad. So we have good, uh, gray, and good. So what is gray? Gray is missing data. Now, why is this missing data? So this is um, diameter. We can check that on a CMM. Position, we can check that on a CMM. Thread, we can't check on a CMM. So it simply doesn't have this information. So we're gonna click on here, and we can see that here's the diameter and it passed. So we're going to click on the next button and here's our thread. Now it's the same idea as the shop floor data collection, right? I need to know who measured it, what gauge are they using to measure it? I can come down here and select my thread gauge if there happens to be a procedure associated with it. Um, and then is it good, bad, except what is it? Well, this is a good part, it passed. So we click on save and now it turned green and then I'll move on to the next one, okay? So you can enter that information here. Just as a side note, if this thread would have been checked um, using the shop floor data collection system, it would have already been in here and already been green or red, depending on if it was good or bad. So it's a good way to show that, oh, this is how we can marry this data from the shop floor and from the CMM. So it all comes into the database. And then when we click on inspection reports, here's where we were before when we did our in-process check sheet. One below it is single piece report. We'll simply click on that. And then this is set up as a default for AS9102. Um, for all of our aerospace people, they're very, well, <laughs> very familiar with that. But you can have as many templates as you want in here. Um, and for as many customers, different levels, whatever you'd like. It's completely up to you and it's completely flexible. So for our, here's our form one, has all the information here that we automatically captured from the, um, uh, from the print. We have our form two, which has our uh, material right here that we, get, that we um, selected off the print. And our form three with, with all of our dimensional information all of our results, all of our nominals, the specification itself, whether it was good or bad, we can see here's the um, uh, flatness that it measured out. Here's the thread that I passed just, whoops, that I passed just a minute ago. I do that. That information's right here. And then in the attachments, we can say, oh, here's a sample material cert. This is the one that we populated right when we, um, uh, when we did the material right at the beginning. 
So all of that information is in the database and captured and then populated on the report itself. Now we're, we're going to not save this. Like, oop, maybe we should have saved that. No, you don't have to save it. Why? Because it's in the database. If we go up here to reports, everything we do is logged and tracked and in the database. We can simply go to the little eyeball if we want to view it again, and the same exact form comes up. Okay, so everything is in the database. So that's kind of like the beginning to end. Um, I'd like to open, with your, there's more to it. Uh, what I mean by that is um, if you'd like uh, SPC, for example, or um, we can automatically push this information into APQP documentation. So your control plans and PFEMAs and uh, process flows are automatically generated. We ha have all of that functionality as well, but that's a little out of the scope for today. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it back over to Lisa and open it up for any questions. Great, thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your expertise with us. As Tim mentioned, now is the time when we would like to open the floor for questions. Feel free to go ahead and type into the Q&A tab that you see at the bottom or the chat. And we actually have had a couple of questions come in throughout the session, so let's dive right in. Okay. The first question we received says, how long does it take to get trained? Oh, training is a good question. Um, so training comes with the software, comes with the complete package. And we typically, it, um, we break it up into sessions, but there's overall one to two days of training. So this doesn't take long at all to get up and running. But again, we break it out into sessions, maybe a couple hours here and a couple hours there um, to make sure we just step you through the system accordingly. But it doesn't take long at all. It's a very simplified system, as you can see by how I was um, working through it. So good question. Great, here is another question. Can this be used with 3D models? Oh, absolutely. Oh, you probably saw the 3D model tab I accidentally clicked on. Um, yes, so if you happen to have a 3D model, could be CAPTIA, could be a PRT file, SOLIDWORKS, whatever, and it has the MBD information on it, um, the, or PMI data sometimes it's called, we can automatically bring that information in and populate the bill of characteristics with all of the MBD information. So that's um, part of it and um, uh, part of the software, I should say. And then it actually gets pretty cool after that. We can automatically populate that into a 2D drawing. So we can create the 2D drawing from the 3D model. And we can even put it on letterhead and multiple views. Uh, we can also create a 3D PDF. Uh, directly from that model, that's again free. You can share it with whomever you'd like to share it with. So yes, great question. We'd, uh, we can certainly use the 3D information um, to um, generate it instead of using a 2D print. Excellent. Okay, here's another question. Is it possible to export existing part drawing to the software to add balloon and all other features? Export existing part could you read that again, Lisa? Sure. It says, is it possible to export existing part drawing to this software to add balloon and all other features? I guess I'm not understanding what you mean because we're, this is a, like a PDF drawing or something, a uh, TIFF or a JPEG, what have you, and we bring it in and balloon it from there. So I guess, I uh, apologize. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by, uh, by that. Feel free to type back into the chat there and, and clarify. <laughs> okay, great. Here's one other question from the same ind individual, actually. It says, um, what base PC system requirements are used to support the software or needed to support the software? Oh, it's super, super lightweight. Uh, good question. It's, it's a very lightweight system. It doesn't have many PC requirements other than, uh, quite honestly, just a basic system. What do I mean by that? Uh, if is it running Windows? Is it you know not 20 years old? <laughs> um, uh, the graphics is very, uh, let's call it simplified uh, on my system. I mean, I'm using a laptop. It's not a high level laptop. Uh, we do have base requirements and we could be happy to submit those to you as well. Um, but it's not extraordinary at all. It's not like, oh, you need this video card and this high level this, this high level that. Um, it is a pretty basic system. 
Okay, great. Here is another question. Let's see. Will the data feed into an inspection report, a custom inspection report at real time? So we'll have to have, you can do things, you can set tasks up. That's a good question. You can set tasks up to happen automatically, right? So on, on this um, trigger, then perform this task. So we do have that functionality in there. Um, but typically people from a report standpoint will just go in and create a report. Now, if we're talking about dimensional reports or um, FAI reports, for example, that's what I mean. But if you'd like maybe a statistical um, uh, data sent to you every Monday for the previous week, you know, those are triggers and tasks that we can set up in the system um, to, uh, to accomplish that. Okay, so we've had a couple of people asking about pricing. And of course, this is something I just want to mention that we would be happy to, you know, provide you with a, a price quote. Be sure to include your preferred contact information within the chat there. And we will be happy to follow up with you following the session. Um, Tim, if, if you want to talk to the promotion one more time at this yeah, point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just going to mention that. So um, we work on a subscription basis. So it's a 12 month subscription. Right now we're offering 15 months for the price of the 12. And the reason we, I mean, we don't mean to be secretive. We're actually very open with pricing, but it's, it gets a little complicated. What do I mean by that? Uh, we have different options for the software, which all have different pricing uh, requirements or um, levels, if you will. If you want to be uh, a, a, what we call a node lock license, or we have a floating license, or if you want the uh, database on the server or if it's local. So there's different options associated and we never know what situation the customer's in. So we don't want to say, hey, oh yeah, you're, uh, you know, enterprise level, I need 20 different floating licenses with a thousand different IME, IMX. Um, you know, that's going to be a whole different situation than, you know, a, a five person job shop that says, hey, I just, uh, I need it for, grabbing the data from this, ballooning it, grabbing the data from the CMM and populating it into an FAI. So there's different situations. So it's hard for us to say, here's the price because they're, um, everything's kind of modularized and um, available in those. So I apologize for not being able to answer that, but do know that uh, the 50 month subscription and the beautiful thing about a subscription in general is that you can cancel it, right? You can cancel it. You're not buying the software and then let's call it stuck with the software. So we're always improving, we're always adding. There's always uh, releases every year to, um, and then bug fixes within those releases, but we're always improving and always adding functionality to it. So sorry for that long answer, but. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Thank you, Tim, for elaborating. Uh, at this time, it looks like that is it for the questions. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and pull up our contact information on the screen, but please reach out to us if you have any questions that come to mind later on. We'd be happy to help you. And um, we will be sending out a recording via email, so keep an eye out for that as well. And again, if you'd like a personalized demo or would like a price quote, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. And thank you, Tim, again for presenting. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.